Hey, let's start the show for Thursday, September 17th, 2020. Welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested. Three, two, one. Wow. That's fantastic. Well done. That was an intro courtesy of Grant Crawford. Thank you so much for sending that, Grant. I loved it. It was exactly what we had asked for in terms of different musical styles. Absolutely. And even got the name of the show in the intro. Love it. Well done, Grant. Always still soliciting new intros. If you want to generate one around 15 to 20 seconds, you can email it to me, Norman at Tested, or you can uh, send it over to Twitter DMs, upload your SoundCloud link. Much appreciated. Well done, everyone. We got a dual cast this week, and I'm joined here for a very important podcast. You weren't even here last week, Jerry, but you could not miss this week. My last week, it was Kishore, me, and uh, Trace. Less important last week? No, it was. This is way more important than last wow. week. Wow! This is why you're here. You could not miss this one. So important because Shore had to miss it, but got you on because uh, a big week in tech, indeed. How are you doing, Jeremy? I'm great. I'm great. Normally, this time of year, I am in San Jose at a convention center, and I oh. could not be happier to be at home. Like I feel like I've reached E3 what? level fatigue with even Oculus Connect. No. I, 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 I don't know. I'm an old man. I'm happy to be at home, Norman. This is fine with me. I'm in loving the new digital um, you know, way of life. This is where we, we disagree because uh, I actually was traveling the past two days, so did a big road trip and just got back home late last night to work on the, the Quest 2 review, which will, well, that's going to be a big story. But this morning, I still woke up early, and I, I miss the, the excitement of driving down to San Jose. <laughs> so normally, you know, with the previous Oculus Connect events, the keynote would be at 10 a.m. I would have to account for the Bay Area traffic. I would leave. I would wake up at 7 get on the road by eight and give myself an hour and a half to get to San Jose. And Sometimes usually, arrive late. I'd oh, save you mostly, a seat. Most of the time arrive late. Miscalculate, get stuck in that San Bruno traffic, arrive and like the parking lot would fill up right when I got there. Scramble and getting messages from Jeremy. Where are you? Where are you? I miss all that. Do you? Wow. Not like, me. <laughs> <laughs> not me. Not me. And, and you know what? Um, I, of 15,000 people, I don't know how many people usually attend Connect, but I think a lot of people enjoy, you know, enjoyed being able to attend it online despite uh, whether or not you could actually be physically in San Jose. I think it worked out. You know, we'll talk about the numbers. And I think it reached up to 18 or 19,000 at some point on the stream I was watching. Uh, but they're, they're relative numbers. And but before we get into the whole thing, because that's going to be our, our big top story, we're going to basically have two big things to talk about this episode. Uh, it was good to see you over the weekend, Jeremy. You stopped by for a little bit to, yep, to, to make a cameo, time. to make a yes. cameo in, the, in your Quest 2 review. That was fun. Help and help me hold the camera uh, at some points. Uh, so much appreciated there. Um, and wow, yeah, it's, it's it felt like a long time. Uh, where, where are we right now? I'm, I'm like, I've lost track of the days. We are two weeks away, is that right? From the release of Star Wars Squadrons, for those of you counting. Yes, that's yep. about right. Uh, we're not going to talk about Mulan. We, you missed out on our Mulan talk last week. So glad you missed all the controversy there. Mm -hmm. You want to give a, your, your out of five star rating real quick? Oh, the, oh of the controversy or no, of the, the, movie? The, the, the movie? The movie. I, I give the controversy a five star rating and I give... <laughs> I give the movie uh, a four and a half. I we oh, wow. I enjoyed it. We enjoyed it. We really did. I mean, it's got some of the best fight scenes in time. You know, time I can remember, and it's got a good message. Loved watching it with my daughter and my, with my mm. family. You mm. know, I, uh, but I you know the controversy is for real too. You know, one of the revelations we had, or that when you came over. Uh, and you saw like the, the I gave you a tour of the house and all the renovations that we've been doing, you know, my office and living rooms. I didn't realize you got a new TV. <laughs> you didn't tell us. You, we do a technology podcast every week and you didn't, how could you not let us know that you were on a TV quest? Well, I don't recall you Last mentioning it either. And that, well, I, I did a review. I, 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 there's a video on the site of the new TV setup that I have. I, you know, I got to come 
I got to confess, Norman, I don't watch every video on Tested. And so I didn't know about that. I don't recall it coming up in the podcast, but you're right. I did. I got a new TV. Uh, I, I upgraded my five-year-old um, LCD with an OLED from LG. I didn't know you'd bought the exact same TV. So we have to yeah. compare uh, settings. I, I'm, I'm still tweaking mine. What, what have you thought? Have you tried the filmmaker mode? That's yeah. the, yeah. Yeah. And, and did you come away with the same conclusion I did, which is I actually kind of prefer the normal cinema HD or the HDR modes, like the filmmaker mode capping the brightness. I, I think personally, I like it bright, even though that may not be the filmmaker's intent. Whatever. I mean, I, I like, I'm, I'm totally into turning off the screen, the frame rate interpolation stuff. That's my first thing I ever do when I, you know, get a new TV. And I guess I haven't had too many generations of TVs to actually do that, but I do do that first. Uh, and that's fine. But the, oddly, one of the settings is not filmmaker mode, but the, like some of the presets in there for the picture settings. One of yeah. them is like supposed to be, you know, cinema and yep. there's cinema home and regular cinema. Yes. Now, one of those has frame rate interpolation turned on and you can't turn yeah. it off. That's right. That, I believe that is the cinema home version. It tur do not, yeah. 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 It's very confusing. And also uh, when you, when your feed has HDR, if you're watching an HDR stream on Disney plus on, on mm -hmm. Netflix or on a, on a disc, when HDR gets turned on, you get a different set of presets. I know we're getting into the weeds and this is something that's only irrelevant to people who have OLEDs, LG OLEDs, uh, but it's, it's just speaks to the state of how confusing TV settings are these days and optimizing, and calibrating and, and why people are so obsessed with the minutia of calibration uh, and why every year you got to kind of go to the forums and see, you know, what's changed in the UI and what's changed in the backend because there are new processors that interpret the images differently. Uh, I know Will, uh, who we're going to try to get on the podcast at some point to talk about his upcoming TV quest. Uh, he posted a thread on Twitter about the debate of whether he should go with OLED or an LCD. And we did a comparison last year between the Samsung uh, HDR LCDs, you know, their LED backlit LCDs and the OLEDs and LCDs get extremely bright. Yeah, the, the black levels aren't as deep as the OLEDs. And I still think dollar for dollar, the OLEDs give a better experience because of that contrast, because of that HDR quality. Uh, but he's really concerned about burn-in. I know Gary's been burned by burn-in. You know, it's not the only place that an OLED versus LCD discussion is being had today, Norm. Can we move into the top story? Oh, wow. What a transition. Uh Yes, yes, Jeremy. I had to think about that for a second, but you are absolutely right. Uh, OLED and LCD. Where, I can't, where's, where's, my, where's my adjustment? I can't even... Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay, yes. Let's move on to our top story. We lost Jeremy's picture for a second. He is now imaging happened? webcam. Now, now you're back to the old webcam. What? Your, Your image quality has gone to crap. You don't know how hard I worked on that. I, oh. got, the, I got the power <laughs> adapter and everything. You, oh my. We, we lost you. You're going oh. back to your old Logitech. This Where's that logo? The, 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 the Logi logo on the bottom. All right. Well, uh, well, we'll stick with this. At least our microphones are aligned. Hey, there you go. Right there. High five. <laughs> High five, boom arms. <laughs> High five, boom arms. Yeah, well done, people catching that in the video. If you're watching the video, you'll get what we're saying. But if you're not, this is all this is all filler. All right. Uh, the big news, top story, we're going in. A, we've got two things to talk about. And we're going to talk about uh, uh, Facebook. Sorry, Facebook Connect first, which happened this morning via live stream. No one was in San Jose to, to be in a room. It was all pre-recorded video. They got cameras, nice cameras in, uh, you know, in, in Mark Zuckerberg's house, presumably his house. Maybe it wasn't his house. Uh, in a lot of the, the teams there, Boz, of course, was there. They did some fake video conferencing. It was all a little bit, you know, the t modern era of stilted live stream, quote unquote, keynotes, for which I still think Apple has probably done the best job of that. And they did have one earlier this week as well. Uh, but <laughs> shocker, the news, most of the news was dropped and leaked two days ago. So the big reveal, Quest 2, pre-orders today, $300, a big price drop, improved hardware. The fact that they're calling it a Quest 2 uh, is very notable. You know, they don't see this as a Quest Plus, Quest Pro, Quest S. They're right. calling it Quest 2. The first uh, Oculus 2 product. 
That's true. Except for DK2. Oh, uh, you're right. You're right. Yes, yes. The Quest 2. Uh, and they not only accidentally released the launch video, but also a bunch of the training videos on, what was it, Monday morning. You sent me a Slack message. And I was freaking out because we were still preparing our review. Thankfully, the embargo embargoes still held and there were still things to still surprise people with, um, with our impressions and with the, the announcements. But, you know, they kind of a deflated announcement. Uh, also, people had been expecting this. There were those leaked pictures that we saw weeks and weeks ago. The fact that the first quest was discontinued with retailers and even on the Oculus site, not just in short supply, uh, is out of stock for so long, uh, really, you know, foreshadowed the launch of this product today. Right. Yeah, the biggest news, I think, b- being the price drop, that did not leak. So that's, you know, one thing that they got to reveal uh, today, this morning to people is that you know, the Quest 2 now starts at $299, $100 less than the base Quest 1. Uh, same capacity, but, you know, 50% more pixels, uh, you know, this new processor, which has a lot more headroom and um, revised controllers. Uh, and a potentially a 90 hertz refresh rate, which isn't unlocked yet, but um, hopefully by the time this comes out, we'll start seeing some recompiles by some of the devs to see what that, how that affects battery life and you know just general use. But the best thing I think is the display because now you have that full um, RGB stripe uh, pixel fill and higher resolution. Yes, no, the OLEDs are gone. Carmack said as much, like he implied that they would have done this had they you know, arrived at the Rift S and, and um, Oculus Go technology a little sooner, but uh, they went with OLEDs for Quest 1. But yeah, so this is an, an LCD future. And it's for me, I'm okay with that. I know a lot of people swear by black levels. It's really important, especially in space games or, you know, other games where you, you want a black background. Hey, Beat Saber, Tetris Effect, all have dark black backgrounds. Res Infinite, yeah. It's true, but for personally, especially when it comes, like I think what sets a VR headset apart from a television is that is you don't have the context of the room. You don't have the environment competing with it. And so in, in a VR headset, what you perceive as the lowest level of gray <laughs> in an LCD screen, your mind interprets that as black, as long as it's not too egregious. You know, certainly there are um, black levels that are just too much, but I think that they, that they hit the sweet spot and I'm perfectly fine with that personally. Did you did you see the Palmer Lucky tweet that you know this week we're gonna finally hit that ballpark? A reference to his mea culpa that one back when he was still with Oculus. With the was it the price? It. The price. Remember he had a post that it must have been on a Reddit thread where when people were asking he did an AMA and people asked about the pricing for CV1 and he said we're trying to hit that ballpark of 350 and you know obviously CV1 launched at 600 dollars with no touch controllers with the Xbox gamepad and even then they were saying you know this was at cost at least based on the efficiencies of their manufacturing and how much their lens stack cost back then and the supply for OLED displays and to see this is probably the biggest advantage of the the new management coming in uh, is all that all the partnerships they've made with manufacturer or with their manufacturing chain, with their supply chain. Um, and of course, really eating, you know, taking the bulk of that cost and, and probably making this at a loss. I can't like Qualcomm's they they're selling XR2 chips, you know, even at quantity, they're going to be expensive. Like, you know, they sell these chips to, to the phone makers and those phones typically, if you're buying the high end, you know, with the markup, they sell for over $500. Even like a OnePlus phone with a latest Qualcomm chip is not going to be sub $300. And that's a significant piece of silicon that they're making uh, that Qualcomm needs their margin on. And then add that to display, add controllers, add all this stuff. Plus, you're not just talking about the actual hardware, the the bill of materials. You're talking about all the R&D that has to go in that and all the marketing, right? Like they must be taking a loss at this at 300. But they finally hit that promised ballpark number of sub 350 at $300. Yeah, um, and, and anecdotally from the people that I've spoken to today, that matters. Like I think that that $100 off at 25% price cut actually ha- will have an impact on uh, adopters. Um, you know, it's <laughs> it's that, it's so interesting to me that, that, that this life cycle, the first one only lasted a year and a half. Like I don't remember the last product besides maybe a phone that lasted only a year and a half. <laughs> iPhone one, right? <laughs> iPhone, what was it? One to three G was basically right the, uh, a short cycle 
uh, update. But yeah, I, I really feel bad for for people who had waited so long for the quest. You know, it launched in March of last year, and obviously it was very short supply through the holidays of last year. Holidays were the place where you really started to get you know kids and and, and younger gamers interested. It became the, the, one of the things to get and. We following the forums, following the community chatter, people were very excited when the quest was in stock. Those few times throughout 2020, as I don't... people were in lockdown, and it's it, very few times. And anyone who bought it like two months ago, yeah, sucks. Or more recently, I mean, I don't think it's ever been readily available. It's it was going on eBay as as late as the last month for retail price as a used item. You know, so these are. These were highly sought after, and that brings me to wonder, like, in terms of of the of the profit margin for Quest Two, like the one thing that they could do to maybe shave a little bit of cost was now higher, um, you know, manufacturing projections. Since they now knew the demand for this product was higher than they anticipated, they could order more parts and lower the price of each one. I still don't think it, it makes up the difference. Like, I still think you're right. They're definitely taking a, a loss on this, but they're making up a bit of that on the head strap, which I think is a huge improvement over the, either the original Quest head strap or this new one, which is more like the Oculus Go elastic strap. Um, this new rigid strap feels better to me. And I'm talking about the $50 version without the battery. It feels better to me than the Pro Audio strap on a, you know, Frank and Quest mod that I've done, you've done to the original Quest. And there are a lot of subtle differences. I mean, the, the announcement for the keynotes, they kind of breeze through all the accessories. And this was something that uh, was a big surprise to me, the fact that they're doing two head straps. And it's, it is going to be an important distinguishing factor. There are reasons to only spend, I think the $50 one actually ends up being the one that makes more sense for most people. One, because of the price, it being 50 bucks, but also because it works with Link. But yeah, like I said in the review, you know, the new strap that comes bundled with the Quest 2, I think is a regression from the Quest 1 because it doesn't have that lower skull support. You're basically talking about one elastic band that goes around and yes, it's easy to tighten, but then it also presses the face gasket against your face pretty tightly. And while the Quest is lighter than the, the Quest 2 is lighter than the Quest 1 and it doesn't stick out as much, you know, it's still a lot of hardware in, in plastic and silicon that's in battery that's in front of your face. Um, and so the fact that they have this new strap design and something that uh, I, I, we talked about, but it wasn't in the review, is that it snaps onto the side and this side arm, which is fixed, has a complex curve to it. It's not a straight arm like it was in the first Quest 1. So even if you have the deluxe audio head strap, I don't know how easy it will be to you know, 3D print a, a perfect mount on this arm. You can zip tie it or something. Well, that uh, was a stopgap solution. There was no rigid strap available for Quest. Sure, no official, no first party, yeah. Yeah, so people did what they had to do. I think I think this strap will be, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to see like 50% adoption on this rigid strap, if not more. I mean, it's it's a it's a, as far as I'm concerned, a necessity. They could have sold it with the strap for 350 bucks and it would have been a 100% adoption rate, right? Like like right. The, the, I think the fact that you know, they probably are making margin on the $50 on this. I think it's worth it, but they wanted that 300. It speaks to how powerful as a psychological selling point, $300, 299 is to consumer. Cause then they think about this as something related to this or buy a Nintendo switch or, right. you know, an Xbox one S that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, 350 for the head strap plus the quest two is still $50 cheaper. It's still 12% cheaper than the first Quest at 64 gigs of storage. Which itself and we thought was a good deal at the time. So yeah, that, yeah, yeah. It's, it still is a good deal. And the fact that they're using a newest processor. Um, but yeah, to go back to the strap, there are two straps, right? There's $50 for the Elite head strap. There's also one where it bulges more out from the back with a battery pack that doubles the battery life of the Quest 2. But it does take the USB-C port, and so it is a cable that plugs in and you charge it via the back, but it does not allow, and you spotted this, a link pass-through, which That's is a little bit of a shocker to me. Small print on the sale page, if you go to buy one of the head straps with the battery, it says that you know at the bottom of the page. And you, unfortunately, 
you could imagine how they could have made it work and they just they didn't or they couldn't who knows why but there is a USB-C jack on the battery pack itself in the rear of the headset that presumably is used to charge the battery when you're not using it you plug that in as well as you I guess then you also plug I don't know do you ever unplug the quest like if you plug I wonder if you plug that in and have the the cable plugged into the side of the quest if it charges both batteries who knows oh like pass through charging yeah that's got to be software. It's kind of, I, 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 right. And I, I don't know because we haven't been able to test it, whether it drains the head strap battery first and then drains. It's, it's like, it depends on what type of electronics they have in there. It's like, you know, you buy a handheld vacuum and you can't plug it in and charge it and, 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 and use it at the same time. You can only charge. It's all about how much money they spent on, you know, their capacitors and right. Yeah, so I would have liked to have seen it if you plug into the back, into the actually, you know, the battery pack port. I would have liked to have seen that pass through to Link yep. and not charge, you know, if you're using Link and just exactly. use, it, use it as pass through. Well, but, you get charging through Link anyway. Well, I'm saying, absolutely. But I'm saying if they, apparently that doesn't work. Like, so that you can only charge through that battery, that back port. So yep. I'm just saying, you know, be nice to pass that data through as an option. But if you're using Link, you don't need to be plugged into the back, so you can just plug in the side, I suppose. Yeah, another thing with Link, of course, is that uh, it's leaving beta at the uh, before the end of the year. Now, I don't know what that means in terms of the differences that will be surfaced to the users, something that we've always pushed for, or, and uh, this is based off of Carmack saying that there's more headroom in USB-C and USB than what Link uses is you know, in allowing the user to adjust the quality. Right now it's kind of a, in the Oculus software, it's, you know, go for best quality as a toggle, but I would love to be able to adjust bit rate, resolution, change the compression. If I have a strong, powerful PC with a lot of headroom in my graphics card, you know, allow me to maximize that compression because I know it's still compressed video right now and compressed video has its drawbacks. Uh, Link will also run at 90 hertz in the future. And my guess is, you know, probably early next year, hopefully sooner. Um, but, you know, the other big news is that they're getting rid of the Rift S. The Rift yeah. S is being retired. They, they didn't really make a big deal out of that and it got kind of lost probably intentionally in, in the news. But Quest is their headset going forward. And we got kind of a feeling of this is, you know, when there was a changing of the guard and management and what the, the original founders of Oculus wanted to push for. But it really feels like, uh, the quest being so successful in terms of sales and a mainstream adopter, um, that's where the technology will go to. Too. Yeah, today they positioned the Quest 2 as a better solution than Rift S already. And, but they, they, I don't remember them saying the date that Rift S would be canceled. And it's not today. You can still buy it on the Next website. Year. Next right. year is what I'm told. Which is odd because, okay, that would make sense if you had warehouses full of the things, but you clearly don't because they're not in stock anywhere. So I'm not sure why the Rift S sales are continuing through holiday. That seems, that seems interesting to me besides the fact that they do have desktop titles coming out and maybe they want to sell like a desktop only headset for it, but that doesn't make sense. So well, remember Lenovo makes that headset, right? So I bet it's a supply thing and I bet it's a contractual thing. That could be it. Also for developers, if they're developing, planning to still develop for PC, right? I think that that's a way, I, like their, their line of saying it's a better PC experience really was qualified by the cost benefits of buying one headset for both. But, you know, I, and of course the resolution bump, but my personal experience is I can always tell the difference between when something is rendered locally and it's just a video out versus when it's compressed video and pass through. And I know compressed video is how like wireless works on the, on the Vive side and compressed video is the only way we're going to get wireless. Uh, but that's not to say I, I would still want the option. I like, I, I like seeing crisp locally rendered images. That's just part of my DNA. Hey everyone, it's Norm here, and before we continue on with the show, I want to let you know that this week's episode of This Is Only a Test is made possible with support from Serial Box. I've been starting up to do a little more traveling lately, a few road trips here and there, and I've been keeping an ear out for new obsessions and audio stories that I can start listening to. And Serial Box delivers premium audio and reading entertainment for people who love immersive storytelling. That's Serial, S-E-R-I-A-L. 
Serial Box uses a collaborative writing process, bringing together award-winning and best-selling authors to create compelling and completely original stories, as well as new content around some of fandom's most popular characters. Serial Box is available on all mobile devices, and users can read or listen to the immersive audio productions, switching modes with just a click. You can enjoy stories online at SerialBox.com or with the mobile app available on Google Play and the Apple App Store. Plus, the first full episode of every series is free. Some of Serial Box's most popular series are Orphan Black, Marvel's Jessica Jones, Playing With Fire, and original series including Bullet Catcher. Forbes says Serial Box stands out among today's publishers, letting audiences switch between reading and listening whenever they want. That's how I actually like to consume my audio stories, whether I'm reading. I like to, I'm a visual person, so I love listening to it if I'm on a drive. And then when I get to a hotel room, switching to reading stories. And that's my preferred way. Marvel's Justice Jones, highly recommended as well. Well, now our listeners can get an exclusive 40% discount on select titles by going to serialbox.com slash test or using the code test. That's S-E-R-I-A-L box.com slash test. Now back to our show. Over the past year since Carmack's last talk, I one of the things that I was imagining would be announced in conjunction with a next generation hardware is a wireless link and i'm so i mean it's clearly possible because virtual you know uh, virtual desktop does it although without all the benefits of having oculus's you know in-house teams and access to the apis and hardware um so clearly oculus could do it and carmack mentioned that it, it would best be done with a dongle that you would plug into your computer and do a point-to-point -point kind of transmission to you know alleviate wi-fi issues or bandwidth issues um so it i wonder if we'll see that later I even wonder if there's something built into Quest 2 that will enable that, that won't require you plugging in something to the USB-C jack, but um, not announced today and remains to be seen. No kind of wireless link announcements whatsoever, but, but I guess they did say that it would regular link would be getting 90 hertz. Yes, yeah, and 90 hertz is a benefit of this new panel and the fact that their new processor can drive this resolution at 90 hertz. So let's talk about those things also. Uh, the panel's LC, like we mentioned, it is RGB stripe. The resolution, they're calling it 2K per eye. Now, before I can throw this spec into my recycling bin of my brain, it's 1832 by 1920 per eye. So multiplied by two, it's 3664 by 1920 across both eyes. Now, that's not to say the panel itself is 3664 by 1920. I can, I'm can i pretty confident it isn't that actually. Could uh, be a 4K be panel. Because it's uh, the image actually uh, shifts the where it is on the panel based on where you have the lenses shifted based on the IPD. So they need uh, to leave some margin based on you know IPD settings. It's one of the compromises that they had. Yeah. They, they made an, a good point of saying that adjustable IPD had never been done on a single panel LCD headset. And this makes sense why that's, you, you have to adjust the software. You know, the Rift S basically did the same thing. Windows Mixed Reality headsets did the same thing. You adjust the software IPD and it basically, you know, the lenses didn't move, but you had the actual images spaced out a little further apart. And if you had a good lens design with a high sweet spot, then that would be okay. Uh, here, they're, again, meeting it halfway. It's not fully two separate panels that you can slide like you had on the Quest 1, but you slide the lenses between three spots, 58 millimeters, 63 millimeters, and 68 millimeters. And then you can actually tell when you shift the lenses, the rendered image like has a slight delay and it actually shifts as well. So there's buffer, I think, on the inside and the outside. Uh, and you and I both use it. And you know, I found it usable and comfortable. I, and I Complete knowledge that there are going to be people who are more sensitive to IBD adjustments that may, you know, you can you can kind of have have it move the lens in between the a spot and 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 have that as a kind of a hacked way to um, to to have an intermediate IPD without the the rendered uh, image shifting. Uh, but more concern is for people who are outside that range and below sixty eight or above sixty eight or below fifty eight, and that's a non zero. Uh, part of the population. Yeah, the, yeah. as always, always try before you buy with VR headsets. Yeah, uh, the processor is from Qualcomm. So it's the XR2 uh, based off the X65, 865 platform. You know, they went all in on a, a, a high-end chip this time. And, you know, maybe Qualcomm couldn't find, like, 
they, they did, you can watch YouTube videos of Qualcomm announcing the XR2 and all their prototype kind of headsets that they had. And their big thing is, is IO. The big thing is a lot of cameras for slam tracking, things for eye tracking. I think Toby announced a partnership with them. And so uh, one of the things that was really uh, stressed upon when I got the product briefing for Quest 2 was that there's a lot of extra headroom in the processor uh, for future computer vision improvements, uh, computer vision improvements for tracking. Um, now, the hand tracking stuff I'm really curious about because currently there's no discernible improvement in the hand tracking for me. You still get occlusion problems. You still get the kind of latency that you I felt with the Quest 1. And I wonder if that is going to be solvable with the headroom in the processor or if those are limitations of the same inside out cameras because it's the same camera system. I wouldn't worry too much about that personally because there's a lot involved in transitioning to a new platform and just hitting parity with your old one before you can start taking advantage of what the new platform allows you. So, I mean, the fact that they got here in a year and a half to me is remarkable, assuming that it launches without problems next, next month and that there aren't incompatibilities or glitches. You know, it's, uh, it's still Android based, but this, this silicon that it's running on is, is all new. And so you know, getting that to work with in the same way that they were able to in the last one may not be possible. So that maybe they had, you know, there's all kinds of new engineering involved. The, the performance on the XR2 is, is 2X, but that seems like the least of it. If you look at graphs of its capabilities, like it's the video, the video stuff is like four times more capable, but the, but the AI apparently like it's got some neural engine capabilities to it. That is where it's really at. And I, I think like that's where the hand tracking stuff and not object recognition and slam where you can not only recognize, you know, floor levels and, and basic objects, but actually start to map geometry onto your your space so that it can see tables and know that they're there as geometric objects. Like that's where this potentially will go above and beyond Quest One in terms of w of what's capable. And in fact, I don't know. Did you watch the uh, the virtual office part of the talk today? No, I didn't. Infinite offices or infinite spaces, they're calling it. Mm. Um, and it, it like they're demoing exactly that, where where they want to give you the capability of basically using headless computers, but your headset becomes the monitor. So you basically have a desktop with a keyboard that is VR tracked. You can see it with pass through and it, mm -hmm. it's like full color resolution. You can see your hands and use the keyboard and then they map virtual uh, monitors around you as you can, you know, as you would see in VR, pull them up. But what's interesting is that you leave pass through on and walk through your virtual space and it, it remembers where everything is and you can program your desktop to be like, I mean, your physical desk, you can program that to be a surface that is remembered and registered in VR yeah. as a three-dimensional object where things can, can rest in VR. So it's, that's going to be important. I think the rendered objects, because the pass-through here is still monochromatic, it's not like we always assumed AR via pass-through would be RGB first and you would need RGB as well as good reprojected geometry mapping for and good stereo to interact with real objects and have things in pose. But if it's the actual mapping of those objects and the keyboard example is a perfect example, right? Like they can see the keyboard, it's monochromatic, but the fact that you can impose a rendered, perfectly rendered keyboard on top of that uh, so that you can see something that looks better than well to be see. clear this is a official like logitech partnership where this keyboard mm. will have will be actively tracked i think it might have you know led lights on it for all i know uh one way or another it, it requires technology on the keyboard side right in order right. to function to to the degree that they demonstrated but but you're right i think that this is them this is their test bed for ar like what they're showing off as capabilities with with black and white pass through is the first step towards you know ray bands that we that allow you to identify everything in your world and walk through life being you know informed and not needing to remember anything oh we'll talk about those ray bands uh, compatibility um i want to talk touch on that because this is where there's some um maybe confusion, you know, they're calling this a Quest 2. And just like every console generation, we talk about, you know, Xbox looking for backward compatibility and, uh, and, and PlayStation looking for backward compatibility. And a lot of that is emulation because they're basically fundamentally different architectures. This is the same software stack. So 
it's running, the software just sees it kind of as a quest. And yes, it will know it's a quest two and you'll get quest two assets in games if developers want to have that. But basically it automatically runs all existing quest games at the new resolution and uh, at 72 Hertz and developers will have the option to uh, toggle on 90 Hertz if the performance, if they can meet the same frame rates uh, uh, at that resolution going forward. So it really is just like in that way, it feels so much like that PS4 Pro and that you're playing existing games, but now you can do it on 4K, right? That, a new resolution. And, and so there is gonna be no differentiation between you know, a game that you can play on Quest and in Quest 2 in terms of the SKUs. You buy one game, and it will play on both platforms. Uh, and maybe going forward, they're going to have you know separate download SKUs. So if you buy one game, you know, and you have a Quest Two, it will only give you the Quest Two assets. And if you have a Quest One, you won't have to download all the Quest Two assets. The Did they say that? Like that. Uh, that's what developers have told me. Uh, and that right now, there's no differentiation in, in the SKU in the software pack. Right. Yeah. Okay. I wondered about that. I wondered if, if, you know, sizes of packages would have to inflate because you'd have higher res textures just yeah, for yeah. Quest 2 users. In the short term, yes. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. In the long term, no. And there are caps on those size software packages. I mean, they're selling a 64 gig uh, base package. And so most of the games are going to be under four gigs. Uh, and, you know, the system software takes 11 gigs in itself, which is why that 256 gig at 400 feels, feels like the better buy. You know what? I don't know about, I mean, I have recommended 64 to everybody and it's, they've never reached that cap. You and I are hardcore users and we have, we would have, that's why we got the 128. But um, I think most people still, I would still recommend that 64 gigabyte version. Uh, I hate media management. I hate uninstalling stuff. <laughs> I hate well, having to un go into that, see which, which app takes the most and uninstall. I just want to have everything on there. You only have Not gigabit about internet, Norm. It only takes you <laughs> two minutes to download anything. A delay, delayed gratification. No, thank you. Uh, the, the Michael Abrash part of the talk today, always a highlight. Um, I found it really interesting that he spent all of 5% of his time talking about VR. It was all AR today coming from him, which is a real change of pace. Like we always get a glimpse of the future from him. And now I think we might be seeing sort of the state of the art in terms of what they plan to do with, with VR. I mean, maybe we're not going to see an evolution of, of the cool displays that they've shown off. I, no, to, coming to virtual I want ver verifocal. Exactly. Like me too. I, 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 want, I want eye tracking. Just give me I would be more and more cool technology. But there was like none of that. So maybe they're just heading into the product pipeline and they're in development and they don't want to drop too many hints. I don't know. But we have not seen a, an AR only talk from him. And that's what this was. And interestingly, it was very little about the visuals in AR. It was like 80% audio. So he oh. talked about like one thing that AR headsets will give you is audio superpowers. You'll walk into a crowded room and you'll be able to look at people. And even if they're not wearing the same device you are, your AR headset will intelligently know to beam focus their audio into your noise reduction earbuds that you're wearing. And you'll be able to conference in people into a, you know, into a, a real world environment from your phone and place their voice in the room, like in the circle of people. Um, and if that is only, you know, exponentially augmented if more and more people wear headsets. It's sort of like self-driving cars informing each other of, of all the information that they're sharing. Um, and I, I found that fascinating. I hadn't really thought about the audio implications of, of augmented reality, but it, it sounds really interesting. And then he talks about like neural clicking. So you'll get a message that pops up and you'll neural click it. I don't know if you defined that, this I want is control labs. This is their, their wrists. You know, this is, this is the, the company they spent a ton of money on uh, as the kind of uh, controller list, you know, reading it's, it's, it's not the Elon Musk neural link that you get implanted, but it's going to be passive, non-invasive wristband uh, signals. And they demonstrated that he demonstrated that through videos and incredibly he demonstrated somebody who was born without the ability to, you know, move all well had didn't have all of their fingers and in VR, or AR, they did, and they could learn to manipulate the fingers independently. And I thought that was really, really, you know, quite fascinating, moving, um, huge potential there. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the I, I wasn't clear if the neural clicking was a mental exercise or if it was going to be a physical thing. One way or another, like it, there's a lot of interesting talk, I, and I, we hadn't really 
said this, but it this is now Facebook Connect, and they made a real big point at the top of this uh, at the top of the event today to point out that this is now not, not just about virtual reality; it's about all the augmented reality things. They even talked about the the an app that they have, which is I guess like uh, what is it? It's it's not um, it's not Instagram, but it's like uh, you know you put up augmented uh, animations on people, like you know give them hats and. Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah, it's, it's so it's all it's the whole space. It's everything that they have going on with augmented reality. And so um, there was a, a lot more of that than just VR today. So uh, the Project Aria was the, also the big thing that you know, Mark Zuckerberg announced and, and Boz elaborated on. Is it and a product? It, no, it's not something you can buy. But this is kind of the getting ahead of two things. I think it, it's this is one f- primarily for PR. Uh, and also for investors, you know, to, to plant a flag on the ground to say AR is coming, right? And that we are, we have prototypes in the wild. So in the wilds are a big thing. They're trying to get away from the, you know, the the iPhone in a bar type scenario, and and people will see these. And it's mostly a PR move because it's announcing to the world, you know, like Google Glass. You know, when Google Glass went to the world, privacy was uh, something that we were still kind of figuring it out and understanding and now a grave concern, obviously. And we have much as a consumer base, we have a much better understanding of the privacy risks of, um, of, of AR glasses and the need for, you know, mapping. And so these Project Aria glasses, they announced will be used by their contractors and employees in the world starting in, in September, right? And there, it's a research device, not, you're not able to buy it. And what it looks like is that it will be uh, devices that don't have the optics that you would need for AR, but it's more about a test bed for world mapping and building that metadata layer. Uh, and if it's going to be using the same type of processing that they develop on the FRL side of, of the Quest, then it's going to be computer vision based, which is very different. It's going to be optical based, right? Camera systems, which is different than uh, what Apple is doing with AR, which is using LiDAR, using you know the, the sensors that they have on the, the back of the iPad, uh, which it's still mapping. Mapping is mapping. And while you, you know one might be a uh, monochromatic pixel with uh, a, a light value and one might be time of flight in terms of a, a distance, but you're still creating a mesh around the world. And you know they're both going to have privacy concerns. That's my point. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, Apple, you know, there's haters of Apple and there's haters of Facebook, but I think by and large, you know, Apple has a better record when it comes to privacy than Facebook does. And and people have a reason to be concerned about privacy when it comes to a Facebook augmented reality world scanning, you know, eyeglass headset that people are going to be wearing walking around. Absolutely. Um, And that's why I think they made a bigger deal about privacy being a, you know, a priority for them today than they maybe otherwise would have, because there's been a lot of concern about that over the past few years. And it's fundamentally to the business models. It's how they make money. And the fact that the Quest 2 is $300 tells you they need this to be, they want this to be a success. I need it to be a success so that they can further their business models, which are you know, obviously very public ads versus Apple selling hardware. Uh, and, you know, we need to talk about the, the fact that this is the first headset from Facebook and Oculus that you will need to tie to your Facebook account. It says right in the box, Facebook account required. And we had news earlier this week that, you know, you would lose, if you create a Facebook account that is a dummy account that does not have valid information, you know, you can potentially lose access to all the stuff that you've bought with that account on a Quest store, you would be a violation of terms of service, uh, which is, you know, a real concern. You know, it, the, the, my, my feeling of it is that I have a Facebook account and I just never visit it and never update it. And I use it and it's, yes, it's tied to this virtual ID that, uh, that they've created for me. Uh, but as, if it's for ads, I'm not on Facebook to see those ads. Right, um, but you should know that everything you do on the headset is potentially tracked, and I think even some of the terms of service have not been updated and won't be updated until this device ships finally. So uh, you should actually, you know, there will be plenty of articles. There are some great people who are covering this stuff on, on you know, Roads of VR, uh, Voices of VR, and definitely look to them. Um, they're the, the first ones to to wave the the warning flags. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a frightening amount of things that can be deduced by really intelligent people from biometric information like gate tracking, which you can get from a VR headset or your voice in terms of like, you know, what how much sleep you got to how stressed you are um, to your gender or how you identify. So there, there's a lot of data that may be tracked 
by you know by Facebook that goes beyond web tracking, that goes beyond like what do you shop for? So this is definitely something people want to be aware of. Um, I am with you. I have a Facebook account. I I tend not to use it. I, I'm on Twitter. Um, and so my Facebook, yeah, of course, my Octus uh, hardware is tied to my Facebook account and I'm willing to accept that. So, but if you're not willing to accept that, I say, yeah, absolutely. Be aware of that. And don't get a quest because you have to tie it to your Facebook account. That is a don't get a quest too. The quest ones will still allow you to have a separate Oculus account up until 2023. Uh, and the the, the uh, separate privacy concern of just identity of people knowing who you are in a virtual space, for example, you can disassociate your real name from your handle. And so thankfully that's still in place. So you know you don't have to be represented as your real name, you know, for fear of you know doxing and stuff like that. Um, in, in games. Mm -hmm. uh, is that it for the, the Facebook stuff and the, and the, and the Quest 2 stuff? I'm going to see if uh, I've been any questions. Like I, I've been trying to answer questions on a Reddit thread and on Twitter all this morning. And most people are you know, curious about Link and how Link will work. And so I think we addressed that in terms of 90 hertz is what we're excited for. We still get video compression. Um, and we, uh, you know, personally, I am still, you know, I send the review. One of the things is I always I was constantly asking myself is, is this going to be my go-to default headset if I wanted to play like a Half-Life Alex? And the answer is no. And I'm, but I'm fortunate enough that I have an index, right? And I have access to a G2 right now. And on the PC side, I'm going to get better experiences with that, but for $300 for both. And with the possibility, we'll revisit Quest 2 when Link gets improved. Um, you know, that's going to be, it's just so compelling for people buying their first headset. Yeah. And that's really a luxury that you and I both share. I, I have a people in my life who only have a quest <laughs> and they play PC games and they're perfectly happy. So I, I, I think the additional rigid rigidity of this new strap and the lower weight of the unit itself will be a boon as well as obviously the, the resolution to mm -hmm. PC VR playing on the quest Two. I think that it's going to be perfectly acceptable to play that way. Um, and I, I would recommend it to people. I, what I haven't seen confirmed is something I would only make an assumption on, which is that you can play Link over USB 2 with Quest 2. Uh, you can with Quest 1, but it was, un it was unlocked later. Initially, it was only USB 3. I'm assuming they brought that technology over. Yes, yes. It still works with the uh, first charging cable with the Quest 1, Great. not the charging cable with the Quest 2 because that one's so much shorter. Okay. Um, but the link cable, you just get that extra length. It's the fiber optics and the, you know, the, the, I don't know about 90 Hertz is whether that will be enough bandwidth on the, on USB 2 right. um, for that. Um, let's see, what other questions that people have just uh, if they're not on Reddit? Um, you know, a lot of people ask about IPD. I think we, we address that. Uh, the controllers, the battery life is definitely much longer. I have not had to change out the batteries at all. And they actually still read as like 80% on the controllers since I got it two weeks ago. Uh, oh. Headset battery. And Sorry, the, con the controller battery itself is more secure. So I don't know if this got a whole lot of media attention, but in the original Quest, especially with games where you're like Beat Saber Pro level, where you're really swinging the, the controller, sometimes the, you'd swing it so hard that centrifugal force would cause the battery to move uh, you know, out of contact with the contact. So you'd lose your controller in the middle of a game. Well, I think they solved that here, although I haven't fully tested it, but the battery is much more firmly in place, not with a spring anymore, but with like a little pogo pin. So yeah. the, a, like a, a metal cylinder that is, that is itself spring loaded is holding that battery in place now more firmly. Uh, also a battery life on the Quest 2. I got exactly the same amount of battery life as Quest 1, a little over two hours. Screen recording is so much better. You know, I'm sure streaming will be a lot better if you do some type of casting uh, because of that Qualcomm processor, no more performance hiccups. Uh, every game I ran just from Quest 1, you know, Quest titles ran perfectly on the Quest 2. Uh, even I got access to The Walking Dead, uh, Saints and Sinners. And yeah, it doesn't look as great as the PC version, but really impressed by that running on Quest 2. Uh, prescription lenses, if you have them for the Go or the first Quest, they just slot right in. Uh, there is no extra ring, plastic 
cap to remove this time. Um, otherwise, the lens stack, the, the form factor of the lens is exactly the same. And they do include a spacer for glasses, but the spacer is for distance, z-axis to the lenses, but not for the shape of your um, the facial interface. And so they are going to sell this fit pack, which will allow you to have a wider or narrower facial interface. And I, I pre-ordered that as well for, for $40. Uh, it does fit in the original Quest store case too. If you paid for that travel case for Quest 1, Quest 2 fits in that even with the Elite head strap. The really? That. Yeah. That's so cool. It's a fit, but it fits. I saw that the Elite head strap with battery comes with a case. So just yes. to point that out, because I actually didn't know that, and I ordered one and a case. So <laughs> um, I guess I'll have a spare case. Uh, that's a good point. The Elite strap with battery visually from the pictures we've seen looks like it is bulkier on the back. So I don't think the Elite strap with battery will fit in the Gen 1 Quest case because that's already a very tight fit with the current Elite strap. So that's that's the, the caveat there. Um, I think that's basically answering most of the questions. It's something that, you know, I'll hopefully be doing more uh, comparisons through the lens shots, comparing it with Index and the G2 and doing some link testing. Um, but it ships on October 13th. And they did say they will have this in wide supply. Uh, it's not sold out yet for on pre-order day. Uh, so maybe they got their supply chain stuff all in order. When I last checked about an hour ago, the only thing that was postponed was the battery strap. Everything else was still shipping on release day. Awesome. All right. And of course, it's available from them directly or their partners, uh, retailers, Amazon, Best Buy, and all that jazz. All right. That does it for our top story and the VR Minute. I know we didn't even get a VR Minute tune this time. Let's move on to our second story. Hey, before we continue on this week's show, I want to let you know that This Is Only a Test is also made possible with support from Storyblocks. Now, more than ever, storytellers and content creators, raising my hand here, are challenged with producing more video content at higher quality and distributing on more platforms than ever before. Storyblocks makes it easy for creators to keep up with the growing demands of modern video content so you can bring all your stories to life and stop sacrificing your vision due to time, budget, or resources. Storyblocks is the world's best stock media service offering video, audio, and images with the most affordable subscription plans and tools on the market. Their ever-growing library has over 1 million high-quality stock assets, including 4K footage, After Effects and Premiere Pro templates, music images, sound effects, and more. And their assets are royalty-free, so you can use them on your content anywhere for commercial and personal use anywhere. With Storyblock's unlimited all-access plan, you get unlimited downloads of everything in their library so you can try out multiple options and find the perfect fit for whatever it is you're making. And even if your subscription ends, everything you've downloaded is yours to keep. That's awesome. Now explore their library and subscribe today at storyblocks.com slash only a test. Again, that's storyblocks.com slash only a test. Top story this week. I actually getting a chance to watch this keynote live because I was um, on the road. But Apple had their September events, and did we get new iPhones, Jeremy? No, I was hoping we would, but we didn't. And you knew it, <clears throat> and they told you. They said it was all about time or whatever the amount, the inv invitation said. I can wait. Uh, but what did they announce? They announced it looks like two pieces of hardware plus one piece of software. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and we didn't mention that about Quest. They also had fitness stuff that they announced. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that'll be a new fitness tracker. For even when you're playing like video games like Beat Saber, you'll be able to track your calories burned and um, just just the taste of what's to come when they can tell you how much calories is in that sandwich you're about to eat with their AR glasses. <laughs> um, yeah, so we got new Apple Watches. Woohoo! What is it? Series six? Six. Right? Series yeah. six. It uh, has a new processor. Well, that's no surprise, is it? Well, technically, the last gen, Series five and four, had the same processor. They just renamed it, I uh, and that. they added the uh, software improvements to allow the always on screen. Right, yeah. So now I guess the big improvement is it can measure your blood oxygen level. 
I was hoping Kishore would join us today so he could convince me to get a new watch because I need this feature. Because <laughs> otherwise, I really am struggling to find a reason to buy it. I have a two-year-old Apple Watch that's working perfectly fine. And uh, as much as I like the blue aluminum, I don't think it's going to be worth the $400 investment for me. Yeah, this uh, form factor is exactly the same. Battery life is the same. They say it charges faster. It's still 18 hours. They save battery life. But, you know, they're on this cycle now with hardware that you're seeing like a three-year uh, design um, uh, turnover, right? The three-year lifespan for a piece of external hardware ID design before the, the big, you know, bigger screen or thinner form factor. And what they've packed in here is certainly more in terms of a you know, new sensor for uh, your your blood quality, um, which your is blood quality. Your what? What is it? Is your uh, blood oxygen? Blood oxygen levels uh, still like an IR light, and it's still using the same same way they would you know track your heart rate. It's just looking at your veins, uh, extrapolating that data. And the big thing, of course, is of course you know the COVID concerns. Your blood oxygen quality being a symptom perhaps of uh, respiratory problems. Um, so you know, fitness is their thing, you know, new colors, new bands, high price. Uh, they are selling this and then a new SE watch version. Yeah. So for $280, is that basically last year's watch uh, through and through? It's like two years ago's watch because it's last year's watch without the always on display. Okay, so it's so basically like, what you have. Like my uh, watch. But surprisingly, they're also selling the Series 3. Still 200 bucks. Well, this is, want, it's the old design, the old form factor. Why? This is too confusing for me. The, the, whenever they do this, and even the iPads, I got to tell you, like they're talking <laughs> about the new iPad Air. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm like, okay, I, I've, I'm on a tech podcast and I'm not sure if the iPad Air is better or worse than the regular iPad at this point because it's got like these beautiful lines now. It's all flat edges and it's like more of a edge to edge display. Um, so it's, 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 it, this is confusing when they have three watches. Yeah. You can look at the price points, but it's just a lot. It's just a lot for consumers to have to understand. I think there's something to be said for when Steve jobs came back and the, the discerning feature was size. Like what size do you want? And then you can choose your, you know, the price point that's, they really kind of both on the MacBook side and on the iPad side, the air name has kind of screw them over a bit, right? Air used to mean thin, the thinnest possible, uh, but you pay a premium for, and certainly, on, and, then, and then on the MacBook side, Air, which used to be thinnest possible, you pay a premium for, end up being the budget line. And now it's kind of their budget line versus the Pro, and, and they got rid of this, the straight MacBook. So like the, the naming conventions have a confusing, but from a standard consumer point, unless you're following it year to year, you're just looking at price. Price is like what you get for that price. And so you think of it, it's iPad is the entry level, like three, what is it, 360 or something? Um, $600 for iPad Air, and then $900 for iPad Pro at starting price. And the new thing, the iPad Air is so compelling this time because it actually has their A14 processor, which is their going to be their, their latest and greatest one. It inherits design from the iPad Pro, which was uh, the the thing they changed two years ago, I think uh, November, 2018, I remember, cause I got it once uh, my baby was born as a personal birthday or a, a present for myself. That's been a great design. Uh, so incredibly fast processor, I think much better design, no face ID on this, touch ID retaining it, but on the button, which is fine. Uh, but again, fine. It's, I say that's preferable cause that's face confusing. ID, sure, I, I think, okay, but for me, like I have, so many times been working on a project like you know fixing a sink and i have my instructions on my ipad out or my phone i guess rather and i it, the screen turns off and i have to like stop what i'm doing and lift it and look it up i just want to touch you know that's great i'm i think putting touch id anywhere is a is a positive thing i agree and i think this speaks to apple realizing as as novel a feature as face idea was and as important as face idea was to get those ir lidar you know sensors ir blasters right. into their supply chain into scaled manufacturing from a user experience perspective especially on a tablet where you can block the you know, we have thin bezels and you can very easily block the camera block the camera so frequently on the ipad pro uh, it just is a worse user experience 
than having something where you can press the your finger on even on a smaller surface area when you're talking about a thin button versus the circular touch id button and this is apple not admitting they were wrong with face id because i still think we'll have face id on the phones going forward and it'll be a part of the system but it speaks volumes that there is no face id on their macbooks that's still touch id on the keyboard for biometric security on the macbooks and come on apple where, where's the bravery you know you're getting rid of your your USB ports, you're getting rid of your, your other ports. Where's the bravery in, in just going forward with technologies? Uh, <laughs> what do you think about Apple Fitness Plus? Is that uh, something that interests you? I don't, I don't subscribe to, okay, like the idea of me subscribing to a fitness program, just <laughs> the absurd. Um, I don't do fitness. But even if I did, I probably wouldn't subscribe to a service, but I know people who do. I know people who, who what is that? The treadmill service where you actually- Peloton. Get, yes, Peloton. It has a screen. You have a service. It's like you probably pay a monthly fee and you get on and you take your, you do your exercise routine with an instructor. Um, it seems like Apple's totally trying to go one-on-one -on -one with that. And they are now offering a, to a, for a monthly subscription. You can sign up and what they got is, I mean, I got to admit the technology is kind of cool. If you have an Apple watch, while you exercise, your metrics are displayed on the television. And if the instructor tells you to check your heart rate or to check in with yourself, that element is highlighted, made larger. So there's a real kind of live, real-time aspect to it, which is, which is cool. Um, but it's, it's not for me. However, it, it's going to be included in the new bundles that you predicted like six months ago. Apple well, won. This is not the hardware bundle that I'm predicting. I still hold on to that prediction, but I think this is a stepping stone for that. I think they looked at the retention rates for their variety of subscription services, the things they can hold you by the balls with, which is iCloud, right? They're gonna get your iCloud money no matter what because you, you film so much 4K video on your iPhones and, and your, your limited storage. Like I've already capped out in 256 gigs on my iPhone, but people were not probably retaining on Apple TV plus after that first free year and they're looking at news Apple news and so bundles are the new hotness it's Amazon strategy for with prime from the get-go and so three different bundle plans they have an individual plan for $15 which gets you a meager what is it 500 gigabytes of yeah, I thought iPhone. it was two no, yeah two, 200 200 gigabytes on iCloud boo uh, you also get um, Apple Music and Apple uh, Arcade, is that right? Yep, Apple TV. And Apple TV. So 15 bucks a month, more than your standard Netflix subscription, more than your, eh, maybe not as much as your Prime subscription as when they keep jacking that up. Uh, but the family one seems like a sweet spot. $20 a month, it's made for sharing with families and it'll get people into Apple TV Plus, get people into, uh, uh, it's basically the same as you get an individual plan, but you get two terabytes of shared storage. And, and if you if you already have a family plan on Apple Music, you're already paying $15. So if you right. if you have that in addition to Apple TV or or arcade, you're already paying $20. So this is kind of a no brainer. I think, you know, this is one of those times when they, they figure there must be enough people that aren't paying, you know, a little bit more, but the people who already are, they actually, this makes a whole lot of sense. And they're actually going to end up earning less from people like me, because we're going to downgrade to the family plan and get more stuff. Yeah. And, and they did that calculation. I think there are probably many more people who subscribe to iCloud and maybe one of those services, maybe it's music, maybe it's maybe it's uh, arcade, but not a lot of the other ones. I mean, certainly I had canceled my arcade subscription. I wasn't planning on re-upping on Apple TV Plus. I'm not, I'm a Spotify, Spotify subscriber, but uh, they're kind of, you know, the, yeah. I, I do share an iCloud account with my family and we have family sharing for baby photos and videos. And so that's, it really seems like a sweet spot. Um, good for me, but, and good for you, but I think you know it's it's going to get more people. They're gonna they're gonna make their money. Don't worry. I still say Apple Arcade is like the use case is kids. I still say that because it's it's got no ads, it's got no in-app purchases, and you're guaranteed that to be the case for everything in it. So it's like that's for me. I don't. I you're right. I played the games that the day it came out. I played a few of them since then. It's just like I tell my kids, you want a game, pick it from Arcade, and it's easy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then there's a, a higher tier, $30 a month, I believe. And that includes Apple News as well as the fitness program. And I feel like, you know, they need that for the revenue share and the cost of running this fitness program. Yep. Yeah, the, the Apple News, um, 
I, 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 I wonder about the utility there. I, I use the regular news app. I think that's, it's actually well done. It's curated. It has a lot of good articles surfaced for me. I don't know if I'd be interested in, in paying for the expanded features of that. Yeah. Um, what else was uh, announced at the Apple event? Was that it? What did you think of the live stream? Their, their, uh, their, the remote stuff. Oh, I guess the other big news is that iOS 14 out today. That was a big thing. Really? Yeah. I, it might've been like a, one more thing, but you know, rather than wait for the new phones, new iOS, across Apple, Apple OS, iPad OS, all out today. Uh, even probably the day before it's already already out by the time you listen to this. So uh, on the 16th, yeah, that was their big sudden drop. Wow. I completely missed that. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. That's a new thing. I've never, that's very on Apple. <laughs> what a year. <laughs> yeah. iPad, uh, iOS 14, iPad OS 14, TV OS 14, and watch OS 7 one day's notice. So developers are scrambling for compatibility, but the update is here. All yeah. right. Cool. Uh, no mention, of course, of the uh, Unreal, uh, the Epic spiff. And uh, the legal battles, of course, and that's still an ongoing. That's the, the elephant in the room, right? This this the spat between uh, the revenue cuts, um, and developers, and yeah, no. You know what? As much as we care about Facebook announcements and Apple's announcements, the only thing my thirteen year old cares about in the world today is the Rocket League update. Which is like free, free to play. I guess the official free to play isn't for another week or so, but they like half of the half of the update happened today. So if you already owned it, you get a bunch of free stuff. They're making some modifications. You can get a new car with a different hitbox. It gives you an advantage. All this new stuff. So you, you know, you talk about difference of perspective and Epic. Um, Epic is still in the, very much in the news in this household. I'm just saying. Yeah. Um, those are our big two news stories. We got one more thing just as we're recording this. PlayStation so price? PlayStation price and release date announced. What is it? What is PS5. It? So two versions. We expected a digital version with no disc and then the standard PS5 version. $400 for digital, $500 for PS5. So if match the price with the Xbox Series X for the high end at $500, but the PS5 digital will be $100 more than the Xbox Series S. And this is Microsoft flexing that oh, okay. market cap. But isn't the Series S only a 1440p device? Like It, it is. Can't, it can't do as much as the lower tier PlayStation. The That's lower true. tier PlayStation is as good as the big guy. It just doesn't have a drive. Disc. Just doesn't have the drive and the Blu-ray playback. That's yeah. the way to do a console. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm... Though? Yes, give me God, don't make me like get worse stuff. Let me make a choice whether or not I can put a disc in it or not. I can wrap my head around that, but let me play the same games with the same fidelity. They can play the same games, just not the same. And a lot of people don't have 4K TVs, you know, and and, and there are going to be, you know, Xbox has their hardware subscription plan essentially that you're paying monthly. And for the Xbox Series S version, it's, you know, it's way more compelling for $300 amortized over whatever two years uh, that you're paying monthly for them to drop that $300 all at once. Uh, November 12th is the release date in the US, Canada, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, and South Korea. And November 19th for the rest of the world. What about Japan? You gotta think Japan's gotta be in that. Well, Do they play video games? I think they play video games. I, yeah, I bet it's November 12th. The 12th mm -hmm. is Japan. Yeah, Japan as well. But outside of Japan, it's gonna be US, Canada, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, South Korea. There were rumors earlier this week that uh, Sony had some manufacturing problems, that they're reducing the number of PS4s, being, or PS5, sorry, being put to market. Um, but they came out and said, nope. Not true. Bloomberg's wrong. Completely false. They have not changed production number on PS5 since the start of mass production, uh, and you know these are all very new SOCs that they're manufacturing, both on the Microsoft side and the Sony side. And the argument to do uh, different capability capable consoles is that you can bin the processors, right? If you're manufacturing and your quality in your certain cores, you know, don't meet the quality standard, but they you can actually allocate those for a lower power processor like the xbox series s that was the speculation but you know we'll believe sony when they say they're ready for full production and so november will be an exciting console month a lot of money to spend october 13th for quest 2 you got new ipads 
sh- pre-order today, shipping this Friday. iPad Airs, new iPhones haven't even been announced yet, iPhone 12s, and the new consoles. This is like the most normal the world has felt in the world of technology and gaming in a long time, getting hype for the new CEs and new consumer electronics. That's funny because did you see Gary with his tweet yesterday? He said that very thing. He said, you know he what? Just- I got the receipts. Uh, he ripped that off of me because he texted me asking about the updates. And I literally said right here, getting hype for the new Apple products is the most normal I felt in a while. Yesterday at 5 p.m. He goes, well, seriously, Gary Woodha, and then tweeted it this morning. Thanks, Gary. Wow. You got like the receipt. A, you're like one of those comedy writers that like writes for you know <laughs> some famous comedian who's a monster. I hope you got well paid for that. No, no, certainly not. You probably but, said this, but the pre-orders for PlayStation 5 uh, start tomorrow. On the yeah, 17th. I didn't so, so today, if you're listening to this podcast, um, yeah, you better hop on that. It, it, uh, pre-orders begin at select retailers. We'll see. And for people who had signed up to get the early notification for pre-orders, uh, the people who, you know, they were going to sell first to people already in the system, establish PlayStation fans. Uh, that's still, I think, the case so um you know it's a lot to take in there's gonna be a lot this holiday season it's gonna it's gonna feel weird because if we're still in lockdown and people want new games to play right that's it's why is that expensive. weird like vid- video games is is done really well during lock you know shelter in place well i'm just um, saying it's, it's gonna be competitive it's gonna because we can't people are gonna rush to go to stores or want to go to stores to buy this stuff but it's all online and as we've been moving toward online model and i can just tell it's going to be for us i could it's gonna be frustrating for a lot of people if they can't get the hardware day and date oh yeah um, of launch and yeah, yeah. don't know what supply is going to be but based on past history i it's got to be supply constrained whether artificially or or not like like demand is going to outpace the supply at launch you know i as as i already implied i i don't I don't intend to get the new watch, and I. But I, for the first time in the day yesterday, as I was going to bed at midnight, I did check to see how soon I could get one, and they were. Del- you can't get one till mid November, as of last night. So they'll probably be delayed even further. Um, yeah. yeah. So you're, you're right. There's a lot of demand for hardware right now, and uh, surprisingly, maybe because people were thinking with having the past year, maybe there's not as much employment. Maybe people's disposable income is at a more restricted level. I don't know. Maybe not. We'll see. We'll see how the rest of the year goes. There's plenty of Oculus Quest still available, apparently. And and let's let's you know, let's make that very clear. Let's be sensible of all this stuff. I know people listening or they want to know about new hardware. We want to know about new hardware, but like you know, these are tough times for everyone. We don't know what next year is going to look like. There are certainly tons of people you know who have lost their jobs or have been furloughed. And so while we get excited for these products and what they mean in terms of technology and entertainment, that's in a normal world. And it's okay if you don't buy new hardware this year, especially in stuff that we don't know how it's going to perform or how it's going to be supplied. Yeah, get hype about it. You know, you can watch YouTube streams, watch Twitch streams. You can be part of the community that way. But don't feel like you have to be out there buying new hardware and definitely don't risk your own health to wait in line for this stuff. That's just in this t- today's day and age, not, not very practical to do try well to bring said. some sensibility to the to the world well said norman all right so uh that's it for the podcast this week thank you jeremy so much for joining me hopefully we'll have a full crew next week you know you weren't here last week for this particular outro but i'm going to play it again because i thought great job did such a great job and uh i know it might even bug you just a little bit so here is an outro from great job so we'll play I didn't see her. That's it. Well, I'm going to the beach where I belong. Where the days are warm and the nights are long. Boardwalk discount coupons at Long's Drug Stores. Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. In the warm California sun. <laughs> boardwalk. I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's great. You guys do that all you want. <laughs> I don't even remember that, but remember? that happened. What was that? What was that? You don't remember? Oh.
you don't you still don't know what it is. Uh, it's the jingle for the local Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk theme park that Kishore and I know. And we sang it that one time on the podcast, <laughs> call and response. And you were as dumbfounded as you are now. And then great job. Put it together with the actual jingle. Wow. Yeah, that's great. And history repeats itself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll see everyone next week. Bye. Bye.